Dr. Nicole Byers, welcome to the Retire Sooner podcast, all the way from uh, from Calgary. That's right. Hi. How many feet of snow do you have on the ground? Not very much at all, actually. We are in a temporary warm week, so everything is melting. What's warm for Canada in the middle of the winter? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. So it's uh, it's eight Celsius here, which is a little bit above freezing. Eight Celsius, a little bit. Yeah. Celsius just always sounds, it's funny, it, 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 when it's cold, Celsius, just the word Celsius seems colder right. than, than what we use, obviously. So the so we, we wanted to talk about brain health today. I want to start right out of the gate. And you've, you've got a really awesome TED Talk that, that we stumbled upon a while back. And we thought, well, Dr. Nicole Byers would be perfect for money or for Retire Sooner podcast. So that's why. I th so thank you for coming on. The one thing that strikes me is this. You make this analogy around how our, our brains are they have so much storage. It's the equivalent of what 5,000 of these 5,000 iPhones. And now that so which is just like hard to fathom, but great. It makes us feel like, well, we've got some we've got some horsepower as humans as, as we worry about the world of AI taking over and replacing our brains. Right. So, however, it's not always as easy. Like, there's not a perfect search function like we do on our, we have on our iPhone <laughs> that can access everything that you have in the iPhone. There's 5,000 of them. So our search in recall isn't necessarily as good as, as we would like. And I, we, I think we all go through this worry because we look at we look out into our retirement years we look into our 60s our 70s our 80s and we 80s and we know what happens in America a huge percentage of folks start to have some sort of some sort of mental decline and there there that is always of a concern and then you're in your 40s or your 30s and you forget something like a name or a password or something that's seemingly really easy and you immediately start to think wait a minute is this the is this the beginning of the decline? I'm only 40. Wait, <laughs> what am I going to be like when I'm 80? So I wanted to start there and give some context around the the forgetfulness that we that we always that we 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 experience and then we start to extrapolate that out. Yeah, yeah, great point. I think something that's really helpful to keep in mind is just like you said, our, our brains have this almost infinite storage capacity, right? We can store all this information, but lots of things will impact how easy it is to get that memory out of our brain. Even something like how tired you are that day is going to impact your memory retrieval. Things like what else you have on your brain, what else you're thinking about at that moment can impact it. We've all been in those situations, for example, where we've been really trying hard to, to think about something. Maybe it's yeah, a passcode or a name and we just can't think about it. And then, you know, three hours later, you're on your drive home and out of the blue, that information comes to you, right? It's not always as straightforward. Yeah, but you don't need it anymore. Yes. Wait, wait, and you don't need it anymore. <laughs> exactly so, right. How, what, explain, is there, by the way, is there any sort of, is there a name for that, like latent recall? Or is that just... Gosh, I didn't need to remember that, but I did. Yeah, there probably is a name for it. I don't know it. I'm sure someone has named yeah. it, but it is a really normal, <laughs> normal process, right? What kind of how I explain it is when our brains try to think too hard about something, it kind of overloads those circuits, right? All those neurons, that's your brain cell that are responsible for finding that information get overworked. And they need a little bit of time to recharge and reset. So when we get into those situations, just like you said, where we make a mistake, and then we start to stress about it, we start to worry about it even more, it just burns those cells out even faster. So we actually need that break for our brain to reset. How, how significant is it, it with the forgetfulness and what is natural and normal that, that we all should just be prepared for? And do we get, does our capacity and our memory bank shrink when we get to be in our 60s, our 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, or is it really the recall of that? What, what naturally just changes when as we age into retirement, do yeah. we think? Yeah, great question. So something else to keep in mind is that we don't just have one type of memory, right? We have lots of different types of memory, different types of memory storage. For example, we have memory for this conversation we're having right now. My brain is actively storing in kind of my short-term working memory, what you just said, thinking about what I want to answer next, thinking about other things I want to keep track of 
during this conversation. That's one type of memory system. But we also have our longer term memory storage. And even that is broken up into multiple systems. We have storage for knowledge, like knowing how to use this computer system that we're using right now, or knowing how to ride a bike. We have memory storage that keeps track of events from our life. And all of these different memory systems age a little bit differently. For mm-hmm. example, our, our those long-term storage, our memory for information, for facts, for knowledge, that actually keeps growing as we age. Probably not surprising, right? Because we keep learning. Mm -hmm. We're always learning new information. We're learning new things at work or even just from watching television or from listening to podcasts like that. That storage keeps growing. But other aspects Mm -hmm. of our memory tend to be a little bit less efficient as we age. So what can we do about that? I mean, is is it something that is just, that's the reality of as we age, Is it dramatically different for everyone or is there something that we can actively do to keep that shorter term recall? And and by the way, is it it, so it's shorter term recall that that typically is impacted? Yeah, it's it's really our brains kind of thinking efficiency that declines as we age. Yeah, Yeah. not short term, but efficiency. Yeah, that's exactly right. Kind of our speed of thinking is the biggest thing that we see decline, even actually from our early 20s on our thinking speed starts to slow down a little bit. But there is some research that that's not necessarily a bad thing. For example, there was this study done a number of years ago where they looked at uh, medical transcriptionists, so women, older women in their 60s and 70s who have um, transcribed doctor's notes their whole life. So they were typists. Mm -hmm. At first, many years ago, they switched to a computer and they compared these older women to 20-year-old men on how fast they could type. What they found was when they were typing something new, something, you know, random instructions, for example, the 20 year old men were a lot faster because that's kind of when our, mm-hmm. our thinking efficiency peaks. But when they were typing anything related to their medical work, the 60 and 70 year old women were just as fast and efficient as the young men. Because we have these other systems, we have these experiences that can help compensate for some of that normal age related decline. So almost, so is that really, it's almost as the the medical transcriptionists have been in the gym for, they've, they've worked out mentally their entire lives and they just, they really don't lose, they don't lose that muscle or they're not losing efficiency, at least in that one particular category. Yeah, that's exactly right. Is their brain has developed that mental muscle for doing these skills. They have formed new, really efficient brain pathways that make it easier for them. And so they can take advantage of that. And, you know, not just transcriptionists, all of us who kind of gain that expertise throughout our lives in certain skills, in certain trades, in certain areas, all of that knowledge really can be used to our advantage, even when maybe our thinking itself is less efficient or not quite as quick as it used to be. So we can keep up the muscle. And then I guess if you think about it more broadly, so it's not just, so if you think about your job and your efficiency around let's say being able to create within your within your niche that's your profession that you've kept up your 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 efficiency and your muscle and then you've got a hundred other areas as well the how do we how do we broadly strengthen that is it is it what is what's the role of physical exercise the role of diet the role of i don't know crossword puzzles like what 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 is a good cross sectional training for our efficiency Yeah, I think there's kind of two big categories there. One is anything that benefits your physical health, especially your heart health, your cardiovascular system is really great for our brain health, especially as we age. When we are not in great heart health, when we have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, for example, we are at greater risk of kind of abnormal brain-related changes as we age, like stroke and well, microstrokes. Physical, mm-hmm. why, why, why heart? Is it just blood flow? Or yeah. is, what, what is what is it about exercise that makes our brain so much, for me, I would just say so much more relaxed. It's, it's, it's an incredible thing. But as much as I don't love going to the gym, I'm always so glad I did. I think most a lot of people are like that. It's, a, it's an amazing relaxation. And then I think better. But what what is the, phys, the longer-term... I guess the why exercise, why does that help our brain so much? Yeah, in a few different ways. So you're right. Exercise is a great stress management 
strategy for us, which helps all of us throughout our life because our brains only have so many resources, right? When we are stressed and overwhelmed, whether that's with work or with family or upcoming retirement that we're thinking about, all of that takes up brain space and brain energy and makes it harder to focus. But kind of at a basic physiological level, that regular physical exercise increases blood flow to our brain, which means our brain cells are getting more oxygen that they need. They're getting the nutrients they need. And there's also some evidence that it increase, or reduces sorry, inflammatory processes throughout our body. So we are not getting those inflammatory reactions that can reduce our um, the thinking of our brain cells efficiently as well. If there were only, is there an ozempic for uh, for uh, inflammation? Mm-hmm. I guess that would be the biologics a little bit, right? <laughs> that would be that would be right. Yeah, um, you know, nothing nothing great that we have kind of medicine or specific nutrients. You know, healthy, balanced diet. There is, of course, some evidence for um, kind of a Mediterranean based diet in terms of brain health as we age. So high in you know omega threes, fish oils, um, high in fruits and vegetables as well, of course, is always going to be good for us. You know, when we study happy retirees, we've tried to figure out what they eat and don't eat. One of the things, we, we found that happy retirees tend not to eat fast food. I, not a big shocker. But we, we did see a really high propensity for the Mediterranean diet as a favorite for happy retirees. I, again, I don't know causation correlation uh, or correlation there. I think it's just because me, the Mediterranean diet itself is really good. It just tastes really good. Yeah. And it's one of the it's one of the few crossovers of taste great and we know that it in a lot of ways it is a pretty healthy way to eat. Mm-hmm. One kind of good news bite if you don't really want to focus on healthy eating. There's this really interesting study where they looked at individuals who lived over 90 years and what they found is that some of those healthy habits that help us when we're younger, we don't really need them once we hit 90. So if you can make it to 90, for example, being a little bit overweight is also a protective factor for us. Having a little bit higher blood pressure also is a protective factor. We tend to live longer. Drinking a little bit more alcohol over 90 as well tends to be a protective factor. So there seems to be this, you know, we want to do these really healthy habits. And then if you make it to 90, you know, enjoy your life. <laughs> what is that's a it's I you know we need to in the studio we need to get a, a picture of I I never remember her name but I remember the story of the 97 98 year old lady who who drank a Miller Lite and a and a, a shot of whiskey every single day for for like the last 10 years or 20 years what I I can kind of see some of that I can certainly see weight that makes sense to me frailty obviously doesn't look like it's something that you want in your in your 90s which often happens right so a little bit of weight I can see that I can the, the high blood pressure I don't understand and then but the alcohol part I I just don't I don't get that I I it's a nice thing to know though you can drink away in your 90s mm-hmm. I think the other thought here is that and this is obviously this peaks in the in your working years, or maybe it peaks in your working years, but it doesn't ever go away. And that is this this the the efficiency or lack thereof of multitasking. Uh, so I want to ask about that and what that does to our memory. And is it a good? How do we? Is it a good thing? But maybe let's talk about stress first. And we we have seen studies that show when you have some sort of anxiety, you you make really bad financial decisions. So if we're scared or we're have in an anxious mode, it leads to really it can lead to really bad money decisions. But I, I would suspect this is for it's not just that category. What what is it just about stress and how much stress do we need to work? Is it general stress? Do you have to be in a really stressful situation before your memory starts to be taxed and you make those not so great decisions. Yeah. Our our brains are really good at dealing with short-term stress, right? That's what they evolved to deal with. That's what they handle best. Our brains are designed to help us jump out of the way if a car is zooming towards us on the street and not going to stop at the stop sign. It Our brains cope really well with that kind of urgent stress, you know, that fight or flight system kicks mm-hmm. in. It helps us move. It helps us be efficient and get out of the way. What our brains aren't so good at dealing with is more chronic long-term stress because what can happen is our brains kind of at the biological level, they get into this long-term chronic stress response where 
that system in your brain that is designed to help you respond to emergencies stays activated at a low level. We get buildup of what's called cortisol in our bodies, which is a stress hormone, which we know can impact everything from our you know, physical health, put us at increased risk of things like diabetes, heart disease, stroke. It also impacts our thinking skills, our memory, our processing speed, our problem solving skills as well. So whenever we're in that kind of chronic stress situation, whether that's you know, a job where you have all these urgent deadlines and you haven't had a day off in two years or how you're jumping back and forth or whether you're into retirement and you have some long-term financial stress weighing on your mind, Mm -hmm. all of that can really send our brain into that chronic stress response. And the only thing we, I guess to some extent, we know one of the, one of the few things that really clears that would be, is exercise, right? I mean, isn't that a huge, so getting rid of that cortisol buildup is that, that's part of why physical exercise. And then as a, as a neuropsychologist, what, what else clears that? I mean, what as, as someone that if, if you were to have a prescription, a general life prescription around reducing long-term chronic stress, I know this is different for everybody, but is that, is it really healthy lifestyle or is it, is it therapy? Is it meditation? Is it medication? What, it, what is your take on reducing that longer term chronic stress? Yeah. A, a, by the way, as a parent and a business owner and, a, and having, and being in the media and podcasts and radio, there's, it always, there's almost like, there's no, never a time where there isn't some level of urgency and stress. Is that okay? Or should I be managing that in, should we all be managing that in an even more deliberate way? I think, you know, in terms of the end of that question there, I think we should certainly be more aware of that chronic stress. We, like you said, are living in this modern world where we're kind of always feeling a little bit hectic, a little bit rushed, right? A little bit like there's never enough time. And I think we are seeing the effects of that on our health, on our well-being over time, even in, you know, rises in autoimmune conditions, for example, there's an interaction between how our immune system functions and how our stress response functions. And we are seeing the long-term consequences of this. So I think it's good for everyone to be really aware of just how stressed, just how tense, just how overwhelmed we are. In terms of things that help, yes, exercise, absolutely. The other one I always recommend is there's really good research that being in nature, being around trees, getting that fresh air provides really good benefits for our body's stress response, also can help improve our cognitive functioning as well. Even if you just have a local park with a bunch of trees by the river that you can go walk through a couple times a week, really great for your brain health. What what is it about nature? I, I guess I wouldn't argue with that. Uh, the I think of if if I have time outside, is is it just be? I always think about it as so. I I go to I go to Michigan in the in the summers and spend some time there, and it's a it's a really it's it's small town life, but it's very there's lots of nature. There's nature parks all over the place. There's lots of trees everywhere. There's water. You've got the, the the Great Lakes, and there's a there's thousands of lakes in Michigan, and there's something peaceful about the water. And I know that we have there's research around how the happiness levels rise when we were in proximity to the water from the Mappiness Happiness Project. What is it though? Do you have any? What is the what is, what is it? I always think. Well, I'm able to go hang out in nature because I'm in a little less stressful position at work. Or we're we're in a uh, uh, and 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 I think of it as well. I'm because I'm a little less stressed at work. I'm able to go out in nature, and that's why I'm less stressed. But you're saying in j- just nature itself, for some reason, does that. What is what? How? Why? How? Yeah, I think there's probably a few factors there as well. I'm guessing, that, and this is just my. My educated opinion here. I don't know the research. Well, you're, on a this, but, yes. you're a neuropsychologist. You're a neuropsychologist. So I, I'm going to yeah. take your guess over mine. <laughs> I'm guessing there's an evolutionary component that for mm-hmm. thousands of years of human evolution, we did not live in concrete jungles, right? We, mm-hmm. our brains weren't designed to live in artificial lighting and artificial circulate, um, central air systems and to be sitting at our desks all the time. This is not how our brains and bodies were evolved to function. And so I think that when we get back into nature, when we're moving usually in nature as well, it just brings back to how our brains and bodies 
we're designed to function. I'm guessing there is also it, it, when we're in nature, it takes a lot of that stuff out of our brain, out of a lot of stuff out of our environment as well, right? We're not looking at our phones the whole time. I'm not glued to my laptop the whole time. I'm not thinking about everything else on my to-do list the whole time. And we tend to be much more present when we're in a natural environment as well. Yeah. I, th- I was thinking of this as you're talking that through. It's almost like the, if we were fish, our natural state swimming in the water is in nature, and then all of a sudden in the last 100, 200 years or 100 years, really, bing, we're in another fish tank and it's a very different kind of water. It's just not our natural, clean, easy water. It's chum- it's it's dirty. It's it's constantly in flux. And it's, it, I think, city life, right? We're, we're bing, bing, binging around with lights and cameras and action and phones and we can, we're, we're fine in it. We can live, we can live in it. It's not as though we're going to suffocate but it's almost though you get back to the, the where we were supposed to be, and now we breathe, we breathe easy. And and I guess there's some evolution there. And, and I guess just f- physiologically, it just feels a lot easier to be on a coast somewhere with a breeze as opposed to downtown, you know, Calgary maybe. Yes. I don't know how Calgary is. I've never been. How is Calgary as a city? Is it what is what is the metropolis part like? Uh, we're pretty lucky. There's a beautiful river valley that runs right through downtown. You can see the mountains as well from almost everywhere in the city. So I think we're kind of in like a natural outdoorsy. We have a bunch of quite big parks and recreational areas throughout the city too. So we're pretty lucky there. It's not too, too city-ish, but you can certainly, there's places where you walk around and you can't see trees and you can't see the mountains, right? Like and like any normal metropolis, mm-hmm. but uh, the, how about multitasking? The you, again, thinking about sp- stress and thinking about these iPhones that are, you know, our brain's supposed to be 5,000 of them, but there's this, just the, the, the one actual phone feels like it creates a lot of, t- creates a lot of trouble as we're always, we're, I mean, we, we're multi we're talking to someone, we're texting, we're on a Zoom call. Not that I would ever do this, but we're in a meeting. Uh, can they see my phone as I'm on the Zoom call and I'm texting? I mean, talk about multitasking. It's like multi, multi, multitasking in the world we live in. You, you've studied some of this. Yeah. Really what it comes down to is our brains can't multitask, not in the way that we think we can. Uh, we can, yes, I can probably walk and chew gum at the same time without choking, yeah. but being able to divide that more complex attention, you know, responding to text messages while I'm listening in a meeting, I'm not really multitasking. What my brain is doing is shifting its focus back and forth. So I'm focusing on the text and then I'm focusing on our conversation and then I'm back on the text and back on the conversation. And every single one of those switches takes energy. We're asking our brain to refocus on a new task. And so not surprisingly, we see when we try and multitask, our efficiency goes down. We tend to at least lose efficiency with one task, if not both, compared to if we were just doing them on their own. What are we supposed to do? I guess to some extent, we should be more rifle focused on any given thing at any given time. And if we typically, if we actually did that, maybe if we cumulatively added up the time it takes to do all those things, it would be less than if we went throughout the day and we were having our processors do both, I, I guess, to some extent. And, and what you're saying is we're not really, we, we're, we're not multitasking. We're doing one, we're just doing this rapid, this, and then we're doing that, and we're doing this, and we're, we're trying to do it in a loop, I guess. Yeah, that's exactly right. And even things we think of as kind of pretty simple multitasking, we're not very good at. There, the study is probably not surprising to anyone who's walked behind someone who's talking on a cell phone, but there was this other study where they looked at stride length, so how people walk when they're either just walking normally or talking on a phone. And the people that were talking on the phone, their stride was more erratic. They were all over the place. They were stopping and slowing down. And they didn't even notice when this unicycling clown came out next to them and then went away. So they're really not doing a good job of paying attention to what's going on when we're multitasking. Yeah, it's like drunk driving. It's like you can just tell who's on the phone and who isn't. Yeah. Just by wa- just by driving behind them or walking behind them. Mm-hmm. The so l- let's think about the the activity then. Well, what should we do? By the way, did, yeah. do you have a flip phone? No, not anymore. Okay, th- that's been my next I guess I've been thinking about that. So <laughs> uh, a a friend a friend of mine has keeps saying that they're going to get a flip phone. 
and go back in time and see if that helps with, I think exactly what you're talking about mm -hmm. here is that there's just no, you're not browsing. Yeah. You're not browsing. I guess you can still, t I don't even know if you can text. I guess if you got an old school flip phone, you maybe wouldn't even be texting. Yeah. Or you could do like, when you used to have to push like one, 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 like two, 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 you know what I mean? We used to do that Ooh, with the old think phones. Think about how brute, talk about... <laughs> Talk about multitasking. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. I, I think a, that's a, B, C. Yeah, that's probably a great strategy. Our phones are certainly distractions. It's Technology is great, right? I think technology really opens us and the world up to so, so many abilities to share knowledge. We can communicate around the world like this. Like we don't have to be in the same room right now having this conversation. But especially our phones and especially apps are really designed to distract us. They have some very smart people that create these apps, whether it's social media or other apps that are meant to pull our focus. And, you know, one thing I always say to keep in mind with when we're considering how much we use technology is all of these app companies, these social media companies, they are companies first, right? They want to make a profit. Profit for them means you paying more attention to that app. So they do everything they can to pull your focus and get you back in there. But we can take back control of that as well. Even if you don't want to go back old school with a flip phone, you can you know, turn off all those notifications so they're not coming up. I leave my phone face down on my desk when I'm working. That's even a really simple thing. So it's not popping up and, and showing me all those distractions. I move all those unnecessary apps to the very last screen of my phone. So when I open my phone to actually use something I need, like my calculator, I'm not tempted to go into Facebook or X or Instagram or anything like that. Mm. Yeah, I, I like the phone down and on silent. Phone down and on silent. And that is how I typically go through it. Now, I will get, I, I, my wife will, always yells at me about that. You never answer your phone. It's because I always have my phone ringer off because if I didn't, it would be binging and vibrating, you know, the, the, all throughout the day. So at least I've done that. I haven't gone to the flip phone yet, but I'm thinking about it, Nicole. I'm thinking about going to the flip phone maybe for just a little bit. I, I If you do an experiment on that, I'd like to know about it. Yeah. Yeah. I'll let you know. I, I don't think it would be a bad idea. I think it also, there's, you know, we can talk about this all day, but there's also this cultural expectation that we're busy and available all the time. And part of that's because we have this technology in our phones where we can answer email and we can respond to clients and we can respond to our boss at all hours of the day. And so if we go back to saying, you know, I just don't even have access to my work email at home, that's just one less thing our brains have to think about. You know, the, the author Morgan Housley, he wrote about the psychology of wealth. And one of the things that He's, he's talked about is that, let's say that here's the, d despite, so we go back to the 1950s and then today, and we're so much wealthier in the, in the United States. We're 10x wealthier than, than we were. But our happiness levels in general seem to actually be a little lower. Now, maybe we didn't measure them as much in the 50s. I'm not so sure about the data back then. But if you look at any sort of Gallup poll about work, satisfaction, it's pretty darn low. It's, it, it's not even a third of people really like their job. And the other two thirds are quiet quitting and, and then loud quitting, which just means they really want to get out of their job or do the, the very least amount possible. And what Housel says around that is that we've moved so much to a serve more every year over the last century, we've moved more and more and more to service. And when you go from let's call it manufacturing. I could be somewhere, make something during the day. And then when my shift is done, I go home and there's just, you don't think about, there's nothing else to do. Cause I was, I'm, I gotta go back to work in order to, to get picked back up. But as time has gone on, now we're all thinking the, the more people in this economy that are service oriented, the more people that are plugged in kind of 24 seven. And that's part of how you can maybe explain we have lower levels of overall satisfaction because we're kind of always working. I mean, you don't have to be a big time executive to feel like you're kind of on the clock all the time. So is that, what is, what's your perspective on that? Yeah, I a hundred percent agree with that. I think that is a really great observation and that as a result, we end up in this place where we're doing a lot of that mental multitasking that we're talking about too. Even when I'm not actively sitting at my computer working, I'm thinking about that call I need to make tomorrow, or I'm yeah. thinking about this idea for this new project I'm working on, or I'm thinking about all of this stuff. And so all of those extra thoughts take up brain space and resources. So it's a lot harder for my brain to remember where I put my darn phone 
in the first place or to begin with. Yes, yes. And, and so it's we end up being less efficient, we make more mistakes, and we're less productive overall as well. Well, let's go back to nature where where you don't have your phones. That's why there's no self-service out in the the woods. Well, I, that's not true. SpaceX it has satellites now that, that travel the, that, that surround our planet. So you could, you're going to be able to have great cell service, even in the middle of the river that runs through it. And you've got full access to iPhone alerts. I keep going back. I really like this idea of the flip phone. The What about sleep? Tell us about sleep and what that can do for this keeping our brain in shape and our efficiency. Yeah, sleep is is super important. I have joked before that if I could go back and do it all again, I would specialize in sleep because I think it's so important to our overall brain health and our happiness and our our really success in all areas of our life. In terms of kind of your memory, sleep we know is when we consolidate our memories. So if we're not sleeping, we're more forgetful. Our brain doesn't have that time to s- transfer those memories from short-term storage to long-term storage during the night. Uh, Anyone who's been sleep deprived for a couple of days because you have a new baby at home or you have a, you know, work deadline or back in college when you pulled all nighters knows that, you know, it's hard to get your words out when you're sleep deprived. You can't think of what you want to say. You go, uh, 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 more times you make more mistakes and silly typos and you're more forgetful. Is so important for us to get that quality sleep, not just the hours, but the really restorative deep sleep that our brains need. So, and again, it's a, is it, is it, is it stress relieving too? If we are, if we have less sleep, we also have a little, a little high, heightened level of stress. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's again, it's not giving our bodies the chance they need to recharge when we are more tired, more fatigued during the day that puts extra stress on our brain, especially because a lot of the strategies that we do to try and compensate aren't necessarily the best long-term strategies. Like we, you know, drink bottomless pots of coffee or do some of these other strategies Mm, that maybe all of us, right. Maybe aren't so great for our brain health and well-being. What's the impact of socialization on our cognitive abilities and efficiency? Our brains are our social animals at their core, right? We are a social species. We evolve to work in groups, even though we all need time alone every once in a while, our brains really thrive when we have not necessarily a ton of social contacts, but we have those really close social contacts that give us those benefits. Even in terms of aging, there's research that um, on those longevity studies, where we look at how long people live, that individuals who have, you know, a close group of social contacts, two or three really close social contacts tend to live a few years longer on average as well. So not just in terms of our day-to-day health, it's really going to help us live longer when we have those good relationships. So it's, it's, it's a great easy case for making the effort of socialization. The, uh, how about this? I, one of the things I, I loved on, uh, on your, on your website are, and I, and I guess these are, these are quizzes slash, uh, informational tools that, that you talk about, uh, on your on your website around procrastination, about productivity, uh, can you give us an idea to kind of walk us through what what you could find on Nicole? Is it hold on here? I would think it's NicoleBuyers.com. Yes, no, it's Doctor Nicole Byers on DrNicoleBuyers.com. Yeah, yeah, like you said, lots of great resources on there. There is a number of workbooks on, you know, why do our brains get into these habits? in the first place. Why do our brains love to procrastinate? Why do we love to take on 500 million things when we only have time to do five of them in the day? How do we find this more adaptive, healthy, balanced life where we can feel like we're thriving at work, but also having a life outside of work or into But why do we procrastinate? What, yeah. and it, is it, can, can it not just be, there's things I just don't want to do? Yes. Is that not, is that really procrastination? Yes. I would say there is definitely, there's the stuff you don't want to do because it's not fun or it doesn't feel good. And so we put that stuff off for me. It's bookkeeping. I hate bookkeeping. I complain about it all the mm. time. I I don't know why. I just don't like doing it. And I resist doing it every yeah. single month and I have to give myself tons of rewards and incentives to get it done. But there is also procrastination that we do really at its core. It's still because it doesn't feel good for our brain. Our brains want to be comfortable. They want to feel good. And so we end up procrastinating on things where we're not sure of the outcome or it's really outside of our comfort mm. zone or that kind of inner perfectionist, inner 
critic that a lot of us are prone to says, what if this doesn't work out? Or what if we're not good enough or talented enough or whatever enough? And so our brain says, Ugh, this doesn't feel comfortable at all. Let's put it off calling that client back or asking about that raise at work or thinking about my retirement planning because, ew, I don't want to deal with this. Well, so you you are bringing up you're, you're bringing up these longer terms. So I guess you're right. It's I think of when I think procrastination, I think shorter term things like, uh, you know, making the bed or, or cleaning up the office, L little little things that we are just don't quite really they're not super fun to do. So we kind of procrastinate, procrastinate. And that list builds up. But you're talking about big bigger things in life. You're you're think like, I'm not good enough to to write a book, so I'm going to procrastinate to do it. I'm not. Maybe I'm not going to succeed at a at a big project that I've always kind of wanted it to do, but I'm just going to procrastinate because I don't know if I'll succeed. So there's really both of that. And what's a what's an anti procrastination strategy? What's the Ozempic for procrastination? <laughs> yeah, uh, I'd say it's make life easier for your brain, right? So our brain, like I said, at its core, it wants you to stay comfortable doing those little annoying day-to-day -day things like making your bed or doing your dishes or making that appointment you've been avoiding. Those don't feel comfortable for your brain. Your brain doesn't want to do them. They don't feel good. So we can give ourselves rewards is a really great strategy. Our brains love rewards. They make them feel really happy. It doesn't have to be a huge thing. I was complaining about my bookkeeping. I always treat myself to a Starbucks uh, grande caramel macchiato every month when I'm done my bookkeeping and just that little incentive knowing as soon as I'm done, this thing I hate doing, I get something fun is enough for my brain to get going. So it's kind of this self, well, it's, it's also discipline to not go get a macchiato on a normal day. So, so you're depriving yourself. Is that a macchiato you were just drinking? Yeah. Oh no, that's just water. It, <laughs> <laughs> this the, isn't hard. The, I'm good with this. <laughs> the uh, So, right. So you're, you're, you're self-imposing something that is a reward for, gosh, I'm not going to allow myself to do this something comfy, comfy, really what you're talking about, com uh, some comfort until I get three or five of these things done. I like that. So it's a, it's a self reward system. And then similar for productivity, what are, what, how do you organize and become more productive? I know you, it's something you write about. Yeah, it is. I think it's helpful there to keep in mind kind of how our brain has natural limits. One of the things I see a lot that is a big downfall for most of us in terms of productivity is we try to do what our brains aren't designed to do, like multitasking. We try to do a million things at once, or we try and sit down and say, I'm not leaving my desk today until this project is done. But our brains have limits for how long we can pay attention. They have limits for how much we can think about at one time. And so we end up making life harder for ourselves when we could be making life easier. Even something simple like I always schedule my day in 60 to 90 minute blocks because that's what we know is our kind of our sustained attention span, how long we can stay focused on one task at a time and then do something else after that. Using a scheduler is a great strategy. A lot of us think we can just keep track of everything in our head. I can keep track of all my appointments. I can keep track of all these things I need to get done. But then we're forcing our brain to mental multitask, right? So writing it down, actually putting things in a calendar, planning out our day, it takes off some of that pressure, that mental load for your brain. You're, or you're not thinking about, it's a, you go to a store uh, and, and you haven't written down a list, you're, you're kind of bouncing around to what I was supposed to get, where the list just takes away the the processing speed you're not that's one less thing you're processing yeah absolutely so that's kind of so how do you do you do this through is outlook is our calendar enough or do you have a do you have some other app that's not distracting on your non-flip phone that does this for you <laughs> nothing fancy yeah your regular calendar works great i use google just because that's what i have set up with my business. It syncs to my phone, which I like, even though I'm trying not to use my phone all of the time, but at least it's you know kind of one system for our calendars. What we don't want to do is get into multiple calendar systems. I see that for a lot of us, especially when we're balancing work and life is we have a you know a work calendar and then a home calendar and then things get double booked or things get forgot. So any way we can make that more efficient by having it all in one place it can be a calendar on your wall as well. If you want to carry that around, those work great too. What, what is, as we wrap up here, what is the, the Dr. Nicole Byers prescription for maintaining efficiency as we are headed into our, 
later working years as we get into our into our retirement years. If we're if, when we're when we're doing maybe not no work. A lot of happy retirees do still work in some capacity, but kind of a less work situation. What is your prescription for keeping us mentally strong and efficient? Yeah, keep your brain active. Just like we want to keep our bodies active, we want our brains to be doing things that are enjoyable, that are challenging, that work those mental muscles. And that doesn't have to be anything complicated or expensive either. Library cards are free or low cost in most cities. There's great research that regular reading promotes brain health as we age. It's one of the few things that we see helps lower risk of dementia or Alzheimer's disease, something we can all do. If you love crosswords or Sudoku or puzzles, those are great. If you don't like them, that's okay. Find something else that keeps your brain active, something you enjoy doing. So do audiobooks count or do I have to actually read, read? Yeah, the jury's out on that one. Our brains still learn best when we read and when we read hard copy, not electronically. Actually, like getting that hard book from the library is better for our brains compared to an electronic version. Wait a minute. So th that's, mm -hmm. a, that's something that's proven. We actually retain more from pa paper versus a website? Yeah, yeah. What, what what is that? Why? How? Why? Yeah, good question. It might change. It might change over generations as we get more accustomed to reading electronically. I think it is still there are still some default systems that our brains just learn better when we can hold something physically in our hand. It holds our attention more. There's less distractions. A bunch of those media, even if you're using something like Kindle, they still have other pop ups and things that probably distract you as well. And I. I don't know if there's, you know, compelling evidence that audiobooks don't work. I'm sure, you know, they if, if you're listening to it and you're paying attention, that's going to be great for your brain health too. That is, and TV doesn't count, I suspect. Yeah, TV TV's okay, right? TV TV's a great break every once in a while. I'd say if you're going to use TV as an activity, make it something engaging. So, you know, watching with your family and talking about what you're watching rather than just kind of mindlessly zoning in is a much more cognitively engaging way to watch programs. And if we and if we get to our 90s, what again can we look be looking forward to? Drinking a little bit more, eating a little bit more fatty foods, maybe relaxing a little bit more. That sounds good to me. Mm -hmm. uh, sounds good to me. All right, Dr. Nicole Byers, thank you, Nicole, for being here on the Retire Sooner podcast, uh, live in vivo from Calgary. Uh, and thank goodness for Zoom. So I know it's a big flight. If you were, if I were to fly there, you here to the southeast. But uh, really appreciate you being on, and thank you for stopping by. Thanks for having me.